Hey everybody, and Tony here with a review of Fibish's Pods Arcuna, which was shown at the Prague National Theatre. The conductor was John Fiore, the stage director was Yiri Herman, the set designer was Pavel Svoboda, the costume designer was Alexandra Gruskova, the lighting designer was Daniel Tezjar, the video productions manager was Lunchmeat Studio, the choreographer was Jan Kodet, the chorus masters were Pavel Vanyek and Miriam Nimchova, and the dramaturgy was handled by Andrei Hutchin. Now, Bibish's Pod Arcuna is an opera that is entirely new to me. I've never heard about this opera before, and with good reason. Number one is that it hasn't been performed that much, and it's only experienced its sixth performance at the National Theatre of Prague, so it's a very rare opera. And this hasn't been performed worldwide. And... Like I said, I've never heard about this opera, but the dominant reason is that this opera hasn't been performed that much worldwide, and it's mainly been performed in the Czech Republic. So this opera was kind of in the bowels of obscurity, I'd say, until it was resurrected, like I'd say, a few years ago. And I think another reason is because, well, a lot of Wagner's operas and even that of Verdi's operas simply were a lot more popular at the time, whereas Fibish's operas, though they were inspired by the likes of Wagner and Verdi, didn't really get the limelight they deserved. So that's pretty much the reason why I never encountered Potter Kuna until now. And I basically stumbled upon the website of the Prague National Theater, and I was quite interested and very intrigued of this opera because... From what I saw, there was a cast of very interesting singers that really caught my attention. What further caught my attention was this five-part video explaining like how this opera was made and it was hosted by the conductor himself, John Fiore. He explained who Zdenek Fibish was. Yes, in my earlier video, my last video, I said Edward Fibish, and I realized, okay, that was a little bit of a mistake on my part, so yeah, mistake corrected. <laughs> okay, so he stated who Zdenek Fibish was as a composer, the styles that he was influenced by, and what made him stand out as a composer, as opposed to the, like, being of the traditional norms of Czech composers, and how revolutionary he was at the time. And he also explained the motifs found in Padarkuna. For example, you have Radana's motif, which is like fearful and full of power, omnipotent, and full of grandeur. Whereas with um, Margit, it's very much soft, innocent, and sweet. The same thing can be said about Helga's motif. And... Dargun is like, well, authoritative. So he explained those motifs and how much of an importance they had in the opera. And he also gave a synopsis of each of the, well, parts. The first part is Helga and the second part is Dargun. He mentioned that this opera is sort of like a mini Wagner's ring in which... Well, with Helga, it's almost like Das Rheingold, in which, okay, Helga is like the object of the affection of Dargun and Absalon. Her father wants her to marry Absalon, but she is so madly in love with Dargun. And when her father finds out this treachery, he dies of a heart attack and thus sets the whole motion of the opera. Dargun takes place 20 years later in which there is a battle between the Christians versus the pagans. And this battle has been going on throughout the entire opera. And this shows the offspring of Helga, who is Margit. Margit falls in love with Yaromir, yet Yaromir is also the, the eye of affection of one Radana, who is a very powerful sorceress and is also a, a sort of a princess as well. She's also a princess almost like Ortrud from Lohengrin. And she has a husband whose name is Wutan, but she is not totally into him. And 
she kills him. She wants Yadamir O for herself. She puts the blame on Margit. But she said, you know what? It's my crime and I'm going to atone for it. May not be the nicest person in the opera, but yeah. So the opera basically ends with the uh, Christians winning and with um, Absalon singing the Te Deum. And, well, that's pretty much it. Basically, the Christians win and the pagans have to be converted. So that's pretty much the opera in its entirety. And there were some like inter interesting parallels between certain numbers of this opera. Like, for example, when, um, when Darwin is alone in his studio or his study hall, it's almost similar to that of King Philip's Ella Jamai Mamo, in which John Fiore basically um, had that one little segment where he sang the sang a little bit of the opening of Ella Jamai Mamo. And not to mention with Radana, her character is so similar to the likes of Ortrud, um, Neris, and many other of the bitchy opera characters, but chiefly Ortrud and Omniris. Though she's nowhere near as bitchy as... Though she is bitchier than Eboli, so to say. So, yeah. And her final scene where she um, sacrifices herself is very similar to that of Brunhilde's immolation. So there are a lot of interesting parallels to this opera and a lot of the operas by Giuseppe Verdi and Richard Wagner. In fact, well, you could say that Fibish was inspired by mainly Wagner, through this opera. And I could really see a lot of the motifs being used. So with that little bit of, well, let's say trivia out of the way, let's get on to what I thought about the production, the singers, and the conducting by the great John Fiore. Now, like I said, I've never seen this opera before, but it's safe to say that this is a really good introduction for this opera. So basically, from what I can understand, this opera was supposed to be set in like the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. And here in this production, it's set into like the, the 19th century, like the early 19th century at a harbor. And we first see, well, we first see Margit, a full grown Margit. And it's sort of like a flashback to how she was conceived from her mother and the strife that she had with the two men who are the object of um, Helga's affection. And we basically see a lot of the action happening at the harbor. We see a lot of sailors coming in here and there. And we also see that in the second act, it's now set in 20 years later, where we see a young Helga, or, or better yet, a young Margit. And then we see Helga like lying on the sea and as if though to say, um, as if though that she's going to the netherworld. And we see her spirit basically wandering on stage as if though that she's still in purgatory. And basically being like an overseer, being like a sort of spirit that witnesses all of the action. I especially like that scene in which Margit, Dargon, and Helga are like, seemingly together, when Dargon and Margit sing their recognition duet, we see Helga's spirit almost like um, being together with them. And I thought that was absolutely wonderful. And, well, we also see that there are, like, the use of screens, well, they also show the effects that it has on the opera. Like, for example, you see the walls falling down, you see an ocean, you see like birds coming in, and I really thought they used it really well. So overall, I really liked the production, and the costumes, I dare say, were actually really good all around. There was not one moment where I felt like this costume fell out of place. In fact, I really liked all the costumes. They were colorful, they were bright, they really like resonated with the characters, and it was just absolutely brilliant all around. So overall, I liked the production and it was definitely a great introduction of this opera so far. And the singing was just wonderful all around. We got some top tier singing. 
presented by these wonderful artists. Now let's start with the singers of part one, which is known as Helga. Now Helga was sung by a soprano who is very new to me by the name of Maria Kobielska. Now Maria Kobielska has been very well known for singing some of the roles, those high-line dramatic coloratura roles like the Trovatore Leonora, Elena from Ives Siciliani, and Violetta Valeri from La Traviata. And then she's also sang a little bit of the full lyric repertoire like Mimi from La Boheme, and also Neda from I Pagliacci, and she also sang a little bit more of the Spinto repertoire, though mostly she specializes in the lyric and the Spinto repertoire. Her singing as Helga was just gorgeous. She had such a bright, clean, and very incisive instrument that is both gorgeous and at the same time like a needle. Like, you see, you feel her high notes almost like stinging needles. And that's what I definitely enjoyed about her in this role. She was definitely at her A game here. She sang all her notes really well, and she really played the plight of Helga really well. Singing the role of her father, who is Gunnar, was Yevhen Sokalo. Now, he was absolutely fabulous with his round and rich basso voice. Well, more appropriately, bass baritone voice. It was just simply a joy. He really knew how to play this character really well as both a gruff and tough man, but at the same time also a caring and overly concerned father to, to Helga. So he really made this role very interesting and very much a joy to play, even though it is such a thankless role, and he only appeared in the first act, which is the prologue. And he was able to portray his death scene really well. So kudos to you. And then we have Dargan, sung by David Shenzjuk, who is very well known in a lot of the Basso Nobile roles, like that of Takaria from Nabucco. Well, he's a decent artist, but there are moments in which his voice wasn't so round or rich, so to say, or it wasn't dark enough for me. Whenever I think of a basso singing this type of role, I think of bassos like Nikolai Gyaurov, or Boris Kristof, or Cesare Siepi, Giorgio Tozzi, Jerome Hines. I could go on and on. And, well, when I heard him sing and open his mouth, his voice almost sounded like Samuel Raimi which I really have to compliment him on. He really had a round enough voice, but, it, well, it didn't really impact me that much. But still, it was a very decent portrayal, and like I said, his voice is extremely reminiscent. The timbre, basically, is very reminiscent of Samuel Raimi, but still, his acting was also pretty good for the most part. I really enjoyed him in this role, and I'm sure that in some years' time, I'm sure that his voice will get a lot fuller and a lot richer, and I'm sure that he's going to handle a lot of the lower notes as well. But there were moments in which he was really good. When he sang pianissimo, it was, well, simply put, absolute top. So overall, a very decent performance, though I would have expected a heavier basso voice in this role. Then we have the role of Absalon, sung by Martin Barta. My goodness, was he the best performer of the evening. I guess I'd say out of all the males in this opera. He had a round, rich, and very, very much powerful and potent dramatic baritone voice. And those are the type of voices that I really go crazy for so much. It's almost reminiscent of the likes of Gian Giacomo Guelfi um, and Tito Gobbi, though also very reminiscent of the likes of Cornel, Cornel McNeil and a lot of the great dramatic baritones of the time. 
In fact, I go out of my way and say that he is totally on league with them. His voice rang throughout the stage so well that I, my heart almost stopped. It literally almost stopped. It was simply put a powerful instrument that he used very well to his advantage, and his stage presence in the role of Absalon was very magnetic. What more can I say about Mr. Martin Barta? He was definitely in his element at the evening, and it's a very, very empowering and very enjoyable performance that I've seen, and I could really tell that he was having a blast with this role. And like I said, he was one of the best male performers of the evening with such a very potent and very rich and interesting dramatic baritone voice. He really gave it his all. He sang his heart out. And he had such a focused instrument. It was just so fantastic in its musicality. So overall, it was just wonderful. It's a pleasure seeing Mr. Barta in this role. And I really hope to see a lot more of him in the near future. What's also quite interesting is that he started out as a lyric baritone, seeing the likes of Guglielmo from Cosi Fan Tutte. But as time went on, he sang a lot more of the dramatic baritone repertoire. So I could really say that he has a bright future ahead of him. And I really can't wait to see him in a lot more roles. Because this is by far one of the best baritone voices I have heard in recent years. In fact, it is so up there with one of my favorite baritones of all time, Gian Giacomo Guelfi, that I go out of my way and say he's pretty much on league with him. And then we have Radana, sung by Eva Urbanova. I saw her a couple of days ago as the Kostelnitschka from Yanufa, and I bet you know how much I thought about her in that role. And she still gave it her all as Radana. She still has a very secure and very potent voice, and her theatricality was magnetic as always. She's great at whatever she does, whether she plays a distraught heroine or a villainess. She really knows what type of role she can play and use it well to her advantage. This is definitely one of my favorite roles from her, from her so far, and she's really convinced me as a dramatic singing actress. She really gave it her all. She sang her heart out, and she pretty much acted well in this role without going too over the top, nor too cartoony, or she didn't even make her a caricature. She made her a strong woman who has a very clear mind of what she's doing, even though it's bad. So overall, she was just absolutely fabulous, as always. I mean, she was great as Kostelnitschka, but this time she was absolutely wonderful as Radana. Playing her foil, Margit was Pavla Vikopalova. Wonderful, lovely lyric soprano voice that is also very potent at the top and very mellifluous all around. And plus, her portrayal of Margit is a sensitive and very sweet portrayal of this heroine as well. She really gave it her all in this role. She has such a magnificent instrument, and the way she acted out as Margit was touching and simply put a lot of fun to watch. But more than anything, it's her voice that really sold it for me. She basically started singing as a lyric mezzo-soprano before singing a lot more of the lyric soprano roles. And, well, from what I've heard in her voice, she's just wonderful in this role. She has a very bright and secure top, and her acting was just magnetic. And then we have the two brothers, Rutan and Yaromir. Let's start off with Rutan, sung by Valentin Prolat. Now, while he has a very decent voice, and while 
I do like him as an actor. I just didn't get into his voice too much, mostly because he did start off a little bit meh in his entrance, but he got a lot better later on, especially in the scene where he got killed, so where his character got killed, so to say. And um, it was just wonderful watching him so far. Yeah, his voice, like I said, started off at a very iffy position, but it got much better later on with his scene with Radana. It's safe to say that I pretty much prefer a more spintoey voice for Rutan. You know, the likes of, let's say, Mario de Monaco. But still, I felt that Mr. Prolat gave it all in his role. And he was, well, a very decent musician and very good all throughout. Even though I do expect a more spin toy voice, I still think that he still did a really good job portraying this thankless role. And like I said, his theatricality was, well, really great. So I really can't wait to see what other roles that he has at this opera house. So we'll see, maybe in the near future. We'll see if he gets a lot better, but I'm sure he will be. So safe to say it's a very decent performance and he still did, did a pretty good job. And then his brother was sung by Martin Schema, another fantastic male performer with a very secure top and such great theatricality. He was able to make this character come alive. He was able to make Yaromir, a very stubborn, headstrong, yet very loyal and loving character, though mostly on the headstrong side. He is very great in playing this role, not to mention he has one of the toughest jobs of singing a lot of B's, A's, and even that one C, which he sung very well. This is the type of tenor voice that I really like, Italian it and very much ringing at the top. It is just a wonderful portrayal, and he was totally in his game. It was just wonderful watching Mr. Martin Schrema really do his role really well. And then we have Dolan, sung by David Nickel, who I also saw a couple of days ago as Mazetta from Don Giovanni. Very fantastic had a very solid and very clean voice, and he was able to stand really well on his own in this role. So overall, I really liked his singing, yet the standouts for me were none other than Pavla Vikopalova as Margit, Eva Urbanova as Radana, Martin Barta as Absalon, Maria Kobielska as Helga, and Martin Schrema as Yaromir. Even though some of them, even though some of the other singers had a few shortcomings here and there, excuse me, a few shortcomings here and there, I still have to say that they were all very decent, and I really enjoyed their performance nonetheless. Oh, and I also have to say that David Nikhil, even though he had such a thankless role, still stood out to me. So overall, very great singing all the all around the board and one that I enjoy very much. And the conducting by John Fiore was absolutely great. I was able to follow along really well. The singers and the orchestra and the chorus stayed very well intact. They stayed very in sync with each other. And overall, like I said, this was a very enjoyable experience. I'm happy to have discovered this opera and I really hope to see more productions of this. I really hope to see a lot more productions of this rare gem because, you know, words cannot really describe how much this opera is totally underperformed these days. And I feel like it's about high time that this opera really gets the love it deserves. And I really hope that this does get released to DVD or even uploaded onto YouTube. So I really pray that this opera will have a DVD release because you know, it's just to give people a taste of what this opera is like. So if you haven't seen this opera yet, I highly suggest you do yourself a favor and go check it out. 
when it's playing, like I said, go check it out. You will not be disappointed by the performers. You will not be disappointed by the music. Everything about it was just absolutely fantastic. Well, that's all for now. Be sure to tune in tomorrow where I review Verdi's Nabucco, which will be at the Praha Satni Opera. So until then, good night, everybody. <laughs>